Hello and you are very welcome back to Season 3, Episode 2 of the AA Ireland Podcast. I am joined today by Paddy Coleman, Head of Communications. How are you, Paddy? Good afternoon. Well, today we have a busy one coming up, plenty of topics. We are going to be talking about what we've been driving over the last week. A couple of very, very interesting ones in there. Shane O'Donoghue of Complete Car will be joining us to talk about used car imports. Also, Toyota Chief... Toyota is stepping down as head of the company. We want to talk about that. Then also the EV charging scheme opening up to sports clubs in the last few days. Linders Group have been appointed as Aura's first dealers, specifically of the Funky Cat. And we want to have a very, very quick look at the monthly sales figures for January, which are just coming in now, are not defined yet. But Paddy is going to put his eagle eye upon them and give us a little bit of analysis. Well, Paddy, I had a fairly powerful car at my disposal there last week, but you also had a, a nice little motor yourself, or was it nice? I don't know. Tell me, what did you have? I have BMW X1 M Sport X Drive 23i. That's a mouthful, but it was what used to be BMW's baby SUV, their most diminutive SUV, has just grown over the years. About 10 years on the Irish market now, and it's one of their better sellers. And within good reason as well, because, wow, it's grown in size. Uh, it's much, much bigger than it was before. And you know what? As, as I got into it at the start of the week, it was a strange one because I got out of the Mercedes-Benz EQS 450 Plus, which made every car feel a bit rubbish after getting into it. And my first few hours with the uh, X1, I was like, oof. This yeah, is it's, it's, hard, it's hard to follow on from something like the yeah, EQS. Yeah, and which wasn't really fair to it because... As the days rolled on with that car and as I got towards the weekend, you know, driving the kids to a rugby game and, and escort the loading tackle bags into the boot and doing quite a long drive, I really did start to like that thing. It was stupidly optioned in terms of what was on it. It was had about 20,000 euro worth of options on wow. it. Wow, so what did that bring the price of the car as tested up to roughly? About 73,500 euro. So oh. 53 and a bit for the basic car. And I mean basic in, in inverted commas of the M Sport version. But we were looking at things like three and a half grand worth of paint, which was stunning. It was a frozen grey paint. And if you do want to see that car, go to the A Ireland YouTube channel where there is a video up there. And... Uh, You'll get the full blowdown on the car, the uh, the walk around, the, the verdict. But look, in, in general, I really did like that car. And I did beg the question, why an X3? I know there's a new X3 coming. Why an X5? It transported or surround in total comfort. I had three kids, teenagers in the back going to a rugby game and they all were totally happy. And uh, look, it was a petrol. It was a mild hybrid, 48 volt mild hybrid, which helps with heating and a few bits and bobs. And tell me then, that was, uh, I would imagine, a little bit cheaper than the electric version coming from BMW. Would that be fair to say? No. Oh, really? Okay. Not with the... It, cheaper in terms of uh, starting price. Yes, of course, you're correct. But when they started adding options, which it's difficult to, not to do in the, in the BMW family, the conclusion we came to at, at the end of that video, not to spoil it, is that we would have the iX1 for the same price because Roughly similar price yeah because a lot they, this happens with EVs we found a lot isn't it they come with a lot of standard you can only get the top spec and that's why they have quite a high starting price frequency yeah and there's quite a good reason for that as well there are lots of options thrown in because okay the cars are expensive but in Ireland as well we pay vehicle registration tax on the optional extras so if you have a petrol or diesel car with bigger emissions you're paying for all of those bits and bobs they add on with a higher percentage of VRT, which ends up being a higher percentage of retail price. But in the case of an EV, you're dealing off the lowest percentage of VRT and any options you add on end up not being a fortune when it comes to the end result. Okay, okay. And uh, good week because I happen to be in the Polestar BST. Not a car I got enough, a lot of time in. I, I was uh, wrestling the keys from your, uh, like the grip of a dead man, drowning man. But yeah, that was an impressive looking car. I love being a passenger in it from the few times. And, and uh, dare I say it, there was almost a, a Blake Boland, uh, I wouldn't say petrol head, but an electric head. It, it, it awoke in your senses. Oh, it, it did. Like, look, I, I, I've been into cars all my life and performance vehicles in particular. I mean, I grew up with posters of, of 911s on my bedroom wall. Um, so, and when 
with this shift to electric vehicles, they've become a little bit of statistics, really, you know, that the not to 100 time and uh, potentially lacking a little bit of passion there. That kind of void that's been left once we've taken a combustion engine out, that visceral scream of an engine. And it hasn't really been filled for, for a lot of people. And for me, that that BST just brought a little bit of that passion back to driving. Now, essentially, when you say you, you didn't get much time in it, you've driven the Polestar 2 uh-huh. dual motor long range. So you kind of have driven this in a sense because the, in terms of drivetrain, it's, it's pretty much identical, the differences in how it's tuned. But an absolute beast. I mean, 470 odd horsepower uh, tuned. Uh, just that throttle mapping. It's it's all there Adjustable straight away. Suspension system. Yeah, yeah. They worked with uh, that other Swedish company, Olens, uh, on the damper. So you could adjust that um, both for compression and rebound. The suspension uh, it was lowered slightly. I think 25, 30 millimeters lower. So quite a low ride. Suspension very firm. Now that thing was not comfortable. Going, you know, you know, you've <laughs> dropped me home. The, the ramps that uh, yeah, yeah. coming into my house and estate, and you you feel every 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 inch of those ramps coming in but that's how the car is set up and the morning I dropped it back I said you know the traffic was so bad so I turned off the M50 on the way back to to Automo or back to Polestar where we were dropping it off I said I'll have a little quick run through the Wicklow Mountains with this thing great place to try it out turned on the cameras just to record and oh what an experience the twisty back roads of the Wicklow Mountains sick um, yeah just just phenomenal and we need more cars like that I'm not saying it's a great idea to have every EV being a 500 horsepower monster but you need these halo cars you need these examples of what machines can do and it might it just might fill that little bit of a gap not, for a lot of people they're not going to sell too many though no they're, they have one the one that <laughs> I was driving which is the, yeah. the press one and there was one which actually could be landing today or in the next few days I understand uh, and that's it there's just the one to go on on sale and do you know what it, it's a little bit more expensive than the okay, standard one so it's 83 and a half okay uh, but you get everything you get the performance pack the plus f- pack you know the upgraded brake suspension so you might have a slightly different paint color or co- so it, you know it is just mid eighty thousand. that's it you're not going to option it up to 100 and dare i say is good value <laughs> i know I that feels it, it wrong is, it is funny saying good value when we it starts at an eight but we are getting used to evs costing an awful lot of money and in particular performance ones obviously it's another conversation about what tesla have done to the pricing but um verdict wise i mean look if, if you want to see the whole video on this again we've uh, a full v- review of the pulsar bst on the air Ireland youtube channel and uh, if you want to get into the the weeds and that, but what was your what was your th- thoughts overall? Oh, it was just a, a great thing. It's bonkers, you know. It's like, am I going to go out and buy one to transport my kids around, or as a family car? No, I'm not. But we need things like that. But look, I've I've spoken enough about it. I think you know, go on to the there's a full article up there on the website and the review as well. Perfect. The question of importing a used car from the UK seemed to have fallen on its backside quite a while ago with Brexit and. Really, there isn't much discussion about you know, the importation of used vehicles from the UK anymore. And in fairness, we could do with them because there's just no used cars around. However, an article that really went viral this week um, by X and Irish website, completecar.e, about UK tax changes that could, and I say could, boost car imports. We're joined on the line by the owner and uh, Editor and head honcho of uh, CompleteCar.ie, Shane O'Donoghue. Who, Shane? Thanks for joining us. Hi, Paddy. Thanks for those kind words. Well, look. Um, tell us why a, a sort of a change in the UK taxation system might be decent news for us, and and really, and how that might work. Yeah, I guess before we say anything, it's probably we're pointing out that there's a long way to go yet. There's, there's a lot to be decided and a lot to be confirmed. But the first step is that um, from the UK government point of view, there are changes happening on the VAT system there. And it has to happen because there is um, an issue where the use of the existing system that they have for car dealers is not in line with Northern Ireland protocol. So it has to change. So, however, what it does mean is that we don't know yet what it will mean to um, prices on the ground, whether it will mean that uh, used car imports are viable again. Anyway, so that's a disclaimer, first of all. So the big thing is, is that it ha- you know the changes that came because of Brexit and everything made it not financially 
viable for in the most for most for the most part to bring in used cars from the UK anymore. And we've seen that in the numbers. Um, you know, dealers, used car dealers around Ireland were bringing them in by the transporter load before. And the, the numbers have dropped off significantly, and that's probably why. So now what potentially is going to happen is that there will be a portion of the VAT available to reclaim by dealers that are bringing the cars outside of the UK and bringing them to Northern Ireland or the EU. This specifies the EU. And I think this is perhaps why um, this hasn't been picked up uh, in, the, in the wider media network in Ireland because this has kind of been quietly happening just in the UK and you know it's not about Ireland it, it's about the Northern Ireland Protocol so it, it's it's not the UK government doing this on purpose to make it easier to export cars or anything like that. It's funny that we're in a kind of a catch-22 situation that traditionally over the last few years you might have heard Irish car retailers saying oh you know we shouldn't be getting all of these cars from the UK and from other markets we have to look after our own industry and now roll on to 2023. There's not enough used cars on sale. Uh, used car values have increased, which is great for some people, but not great if you're trying to get a used car. And uh, now we're hoping to reverse the situation. Well, I mean, the, the, the average person on the street might be hoping to reverse the situation and used car salespeople as well. It'd be very interesting to hear the... Uh, industry's opinion on this. Uh, I guess that's hard to do so far because we don't know yet exactly what it'll mean. But there's no doubt that we have a severe lack of used cars in Ireland right now. Um, and this uh, this might be a little ray of sunshine. I mean, I would temper people's expectations on that with the fact that the UK also has a very similar situation to us in terms of a lack of used cars and prices increasing. It's the same thing all over the world. It's for the same reasons. Um, and it all, you know, is a knock-on effect of lack of supply of new cars. And Shane, can I ask you, how is this likely to f- affect individuals? You've mentioned uh, dealers a few times there. So if I want to import, you know, a Skoda Octavia just to, to run my family around, is it going to affect individuals as well? Um, again, because the details aren't worked out, we can't say for sure. But initially, it looks like it, it is mostly going to apply to um, VAT registered dealers, motor dealers that can import cars or export them from the UK. So I don't believe that the individual will be able to claim back VAT from the UK government. Um, I just don't think that'll ever happen. So I don't think so. However, the knock on effect is I mean, if, an Irish, if Irish dealers, these dealers are suddenly able to bring in thousands of used cars again, then it does mean there's going to be more, potentially more choice um, and potentially better value uh, for everybody. But I don't think it'll make it cheaper or easier for the individual to bring a car in. Okay. Shane, Shane, just to finish off, we're, we're talking a little bit today about the, the start of the market and how things are going. You look at the market quite closely as a commentator. What do you think your in, initial impressions of this year so far and have you any uh, crystal ball gazing as to how this year will go? <laughs> I think it's, it's so much depends on supply, unfortunately. I mean, the, the picture has been skewed by that the last couple of years where um, the distributor or the brand who has managed to secure supply, has managed to secure a, a ship full of cars, who we say, they're, they're seen to be doing very well. And I guess we're going to see more of the same this year. I mean, demand for electric cars is continuing to rocket, um, but that is tempered by supply. So I, I don't think we're going to see a drastically different market to what we had in 2022, to be honest, where um, Toyota's hybrid is going to do quite well, but uh, perhaps they might not have as much supply as last year. And then we're also going to see a massive extra demand for electric cars, which probably isn't going to be fulfilled. And be interesting to get your reaction to this. I'm just looking at some initial figures um, from Saimai, um before we close the month, and the market looks like it's up about 11%. And again, it looks like Toyota are uh, out of the traps incredibly strongly with uh, one, two, three, four um, for cars in the, in the top five individual models. So an interesting, uh, interesting start of the year ahead. Yeah, they're continuing where the brand is continuing where it left off last year, really. And that, that was the same story all year. Um, it's clearly done a good job on 
appealing to the masses with the with the hybrid cars. You know, the, the dealer network is strong, and the, there's I suppose they've got a great reputation, and that's that's why they're so popular. Um, I, I just remain skeptical whether Toyota can maintain supply. Um, as well as it did last year. It's a big ask, especially with such demands on the market. We've been speaking before we got Shane on there about what we'd been driving. It'd be great to see what uh, Shane's been driving. You know, I've been in the Polestar BST, you've had the BMW X1. So Shane, what have you been driving for the last week or so? Any particular highlights there for you? I mean, the year started off quite interesting. I, I spent a good bit of time in the new Range Rover and Range Rover Sport. Um, and while they might not have relevance to the mass market, they have gone plug-in hybrid and the plug-in hybrids now are significantly cheaper than the diesel. So I think that's going to be a rapid step change uh, in that part of the market, moving from diesel to plug-in hybrids, which I guess will be you know, a stepping stone to full electrification in the future. So that, that's a bit of a theme we're seeing for sure. I also did see you driving on Twitter the uh, new Alpine. That looked like <laughs> an absolute beaut. I, I wasn't going to bring that up. I didn't want to draw hatred on myself. No, um, you can't. You probably uh, can't. Can you speak about that? You can't. Is it probably embargoed or something? Is it? No, no, no. The review is on the site already. Um, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic creation. The, even the standard Alpine is brilliant, but this new uh, hardcore model is even better. It's also going to be very expensive. But the good news, actually, for our Irish listeners, is that it looks like the Alpine brand is finally coming to Ireland at the end of this year, the start of next year, or something like that. Oh, we can break out the piggy bank. You can read all of Shane's excellent reviews and his teams on completecar.ie, plus his team also are contributors to the AA.ie. Shane, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, and we'll chat to you next time. Sticking with what you were driving last week, this week, Something else, something slightly different, something with two wheels. Explain. Two wheels, yes. I had an e-cargo bike, an electric cargo bike. So we did a a little spin on that over to the depot of the AA just to try it out for a while. But uh, it was a really interesting experience. So we picked it up from Green Air in Sandyford. They kind of specialise in, in e-bikes and electric cargo bikes but it was it was very interesting I mean the thing has a payload of, of a couple of hundred kilos it's pedal assist up to about 25 kilometers an hour and a really interesting experience and it had what's called a flight case on the front of it so a cargo bike is you know an, a bike for carrying lots of cargo as you can imagine <laughs> really? as, as the title suggests but this had what it was a flight case so you know when you see uh, at gigs and concerts these kind of black mm. cases that are carrying the speakers it had one of these cases on the front for plenty of luggage I mean you would it's the size of a small car's boot essentially in that and battery assisted battery assisted yep yeah. so this had two batteries for a total of about one kilowatt hour compared to some of the cars like the, the Mercedes EQS had 120 kilowatt hours you know uh, but yeah very little um, interesting uh, interesting experiment great to get a go on that as well and is there a future in terms of companies moving towards these rather than driving around in small vans oh absolutely in, in use case scenario you know we, we, we talk about electric cars and that switch over but it's been let down by the infrastructure at the moment and we're also talk about making that switch to public transport but also onto to bicycles or e-bikes and it's also been really really let down by the infrastructure so when I picked it up from Sandyford there was a great stretch of bike lane there and all of a sudden I found myself at uh, the Walkinstown roundabout on an e-bike okay. slightly and that was a very very nervy affair so <laughs> Walkinstown roundabout is a nervy affair in an, in a Range Rover yes. never mind anything else yeah so it, it's been let down by the infrastructure but if we can sort that out in certain use case use case scenarios they're they're absolutely fantastic like that bike you know could be kitted out with equipment for, for a business for six, seven, eight, nine thousand euros compared to a diesel van, what's that going to be? 40, 50, something like that? Yeah, and the rest in some cases, depending on what way you have to kit it out. What's coming up uh, this week ahead? Well, we're going to be talking about the Q4 e-tron, which you were mainly driving, but between us, we got through about 1,500 kilometres in the week. So we really gave uh, that Audi a good test. Yeah, video of the Q4 e-tron, which was the Sportback, beautiful looking car. Is, is coming up as well, followed as well by uh, a video review of the Skoda Fabia Monte Carlo as well, a car that I spent uh, Christmas in. And what a lovely little car as well. Yeah, and that was a one-litre engine, is that right? One-litre, three-cylinder engine, but what a little gem of a car. We, in you know, certainly in my view, best super mini, but it's not just me. It was the AA Ireland Car Awards in October last year where the jury there said by a country mile that the Fabia was the best super mini you can buy. 
So Paddy, as well as the Breakdown Rescue, which uh, a lot of people know us for, we uh, are highly involved in car insurance as well. But for me, this is a topic, um, especially up until I joined the AA here, I didn't fully understand it. There's so many different questions between making claims and so on. So it was great for you to get the opportunity. You sat down with Don Breddon, who's head of car insurance for the AA, and you put a number of questions to him. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. We put out the uh, questions out to social media, on Instagram, etc. You know, tell us what your questions are. And we put that to him. And you can hear uh, the interview we did with Don Brennan right now. So, as I said, we are joined by Don Brennan, Managing Director of AA Insurance. And Don is a fund of information on all things insurance. We're going to focus on car insurance this week, though. And we put out a call to you guys, the listeners, to send in your questions and we we ch- we discuss them. But look, let's start first things first, Don, with the basics. So sure. it's often said that car insurance is expensive in Ireland. Why is that? Um, hey, Paddy. Good to be here. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Your first Thank time you. in the show. It is my well. first time in the time show. too. Yeah. Um, so there's a combination of reasons why insurance is more expensive or deemed to be more expensive in Ireland and a lot of it comes down to primarily the risk profile of the people who drive and the types of cars that people drive. So what's a risk profile? So basically um, dependent upon lots of different factors um, it determines the price that the insurance company will set your premium at and things may be your age, um, your driving history, um, have you had claims? Okay. in the recent past, uh, where you live, uh, the type of car you drive, has the car been modified, the size of the engine, etc. It all builds up a picture for the insurer of the risk profile of that individual and they base the premium on that risk. So look, I mean, obviously there's lots of factors. It's not easy to say, okay, I'm roughly this age and roughly that, that my insurance should be X. It doesn't work that way. It's it's not as simple as that. But look, let's go back a step. Talk us through the basic types of insurance in terms of a car. What's the difference, say, between third-party insurance and fully comprehensive? So third-party insurance would be the most basic type of cover that you can have for an insurance policy. And effectively, what that means is that if you are unfortunate enough to have an accident that the insurance company will pay for and fix th- the third party if you're at fault. Fully comprehensive insurance by its very nature means that you're covered. So the insurance company will pay for the third party damage and also repair your own damage as well. Now, obviously, in, in terms of cost, that tends to be third party tends to be the cheapest way to insure a car, right? It's, well, it's it's cheapest or cheaper in terms of the premium. The difficulty comes when a, a, a person, a, a driver has a, an accident and then the costs aren't in I, favour I of the third party that, customer. You know, is, there, is it false economy in a way because, you know, right, you might save X amount, but in the event of there unfortunately being an issue, yeah. you could be left with huge repair bills for your own car, right? Exactly. And look, most customers, um, when they take car insurance, for most people, it's a grudge purchase. Mm-hmm. People don't expect to be in an accident. Um, unfortunately, when some customers do have an accident, that's when they get caught out. If they haven't got the right level of cover and they find that actually they're out of pocket because at the point of purchasing the policy, they've taken a bit of a gamble because they don't think it will happen to them. But as in many things in life, sometimes things happen. These things happen, yeah, exactly. So and in terms of fully comprehensive, as, as it sounds, that everything is covered, you're covered, the the, insur- the other person is, the other party is covered. Correct. Uh, and for in, in terms of our own insurance in, in AA, are you allowed to drive other cars as part of that? Or, or is that just purely down to the car that you're in? Yeah, so we have different levels of, of cover. Um, at a comprehensive level, um, you have the ability to drive other cars. Um, and many policies in Ireland, uh, whether that be through an insurance broker or even with a direct insurer, don't have that option. Uh, whereas our product and on our scheme, it is quite feature rich, um, has lots of benefits, but you do pay a little bit more for that. But it offers customers more freedom um, to drive other cars effectively. 
obviously with the permission of the uh, of the driver, <laughs> they, it's, it's good to let them know yeah. in advance. Yeah. Uh, Indeed. Another question in, Don, is, is can you explain excess to us? Excess, okay. So um, basically excess means in the event of an accident um, and your car gets damaged uh, and your car needs to go to a garage to get fixed. Say, for example, you you reverse into a lamppost, mm -hmm. which I have done myself okay. um, in the past. <laughs> um, so um, in some policies, uh, they require an access. And what that access means is that in order to get the damage fixed, you pay a part of that total amount. It's normally set um, at a minimum of 250 euros, and that would give you uh, a base premium. If you want to pay more excess, it can reduce your total premium that you're paying uh, throughout the year. And again, it's up to each individual to determine um, how much of a risk they're taking by having the lowest excess, or if they don't mind paying a bit more excess, but through the year they'll actually have a lower overall insurance. They're so balancing their own cash flow and budgets, I suppose, in a way. Yeah. And is the excess likely to be larger when you're only starting off as a as a motorist? No, it can only be um, it can be two hundred and fifty euros. That tends to be the average entry point for excess. Um, it can be as much as maybe a thousand euros, for example. Um, the challenge comes for younger drivers, um, again, based on that risk profile. And unfortunately, um, it is a fact that younger drivers tend to have more frequent accidents because they're, um, I guess, less experienced. Um, we've all heard about boy racers mm -hmm. who maybe uh, bump their car, bump another car. It happens much more frequently with young drivers. Um, and as a result of that, the average premium for a driver under 24 will be significantly more expensive than someone who's been driving for 15 years and has never had an accident. It's funny because, you know, that's the question that comes up after this. It's younger drivers. The rates seem excessive. Are they really that much of a risk? Now, from the other side of things, we see it with the road safety authority statistics every year. Unfortunately, it's younger drivers who have the most frequent accidents. So, you know, there is hard data. It's not just, you know, prejudice against younger people starting off. Unfortunately, these people get into the most accidents, right? Unfortunately, that is the case. Um, and it isn't just the individual that has an accident. Um, in many instances, there are other passengers in the vehicle uh, and they get injured. Uh, and then that leads to a claim uh, for a personal injury. Um, and again, that risk profile of those types of customers um, is built up by the insurer and they base it on that individual on the data that they have available to them. Talk us through, if you can, the cost of insurance claims. So how much does a bad accident cost the insurer, for example? And is there an impact of the personal injuries on that cost as well? Yeah, um, it's a great question, Paddy. So there's there's quite a range uh, dependent upon the severity of the incident and also the number of parties involved. Um, so for example, if you, again, take my own example, if I reverse into a lamppost and I crack my back bumper and there's a bit of damage, there's maybe a sensor that's snapped, that could be a 500 euro uh, claim if I claimed. Um, many people at the lower end of those incidents tend to pay for it themselves because if you have an, an accident and you claim, it affects your premium next year, which may go up. Um, so your no claims bonus. Your no claim bonus, unless you protect that. And again, you pay slightly more for that um, so if you do have one of those incidents, your no claims protection is covered. It doesn't it, get impacted. That was something that personally I didn't know about was the, the no claims protection. Can you, can you just touch on that for a second as well? Like, and sure. What does it cover and how long does it cover, etc.? Yeah, so basically no claims protection does what it says on the tin. Um, you pay a little bit more up front every year or monthly if you pay about all months. Um, and the actual quantum of that increase, it may be a couple of euros extra per month. And in the event that you have an accident, if you claim, you still protect your no claims bonus. So you still protect that discount that you get from the insurer as if you had never had a claim. And do people know about this, do you, do you think? Is this something I th that... I think people know about it. Um, it's one of the challenges that we face in relation to, I guess, where the world is now and in a post-COVID world where there's so much more uh, digital activity. And it's difficult to explain that 
in a way that it can land with customers when they're going through a claims journey or a, a quote journey. Um, if, however, a customer is speaking to one of our contact centre staff, they can explain that in great detail. And many customers do decide to protect that no claims bonus because they understand it more than if they just go through a web journey. But given all of the terms, conditions, everything that has to be explained to a customer on the phone, is that a challenge when you're for call agents, for example, to try and explain products because people are on the phone, they're busy. Is is it a challenge to explain some of those new products because of how much you've had to go through on the phone? I don't think it's a challenge. Um, but again, going back to the whole basis of our insurance that we sell, most customers do not purchase motor insurance thinking that it'll happen to them in the year ahead. And for many customers, not all, but for many customers, price is king. So they're interested in getting the most cost effective value for money product possible. And what that means is that some of the other additions that we can add on for a small fee, people don't take. Um, but for those that maybe understand it a little bit more, for a, a very small amount of additional cost per month or per year, you can actually have a, a range of features and benefits that cover you and lots of eventualities. But say, like with, with that question, in terms of the cost for the insurer, can a simple bump in a road end up costing them hundreds of thousands of euro? Based on a you know a pain you know a, a personal injury or or yeah multiple. so there's uh, there's a um, a body here called PIAB which is the personal injury board, board yeah, yeah and um, effectively they can and they assess individual cases um, and obviously dependent upon the individual circumstances and it is set at an individual level um, the level of a personal injury claim may be a couple of thousand euros or it may be significantly more than that. And it could be significantly as in, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of euros or in certain instances, it can even get higher than that if the person would have the unfortunate event of having a life limited or life changing um, injuries, which does happen, unfortunately, on the roads. In terms of fraud, are there many fraudulent claims and what are the most common of these? I think in terms of claims, um, yes, there are fraudulent claims. Um, so uh, some um, fraudsters would either um, fix a claim. Um, so basically they would have maybe people in a car that gets bumped by another car and maybe the fraudsters are in a, a, a crime syndicate and the individuals in the car that's been bumped uh, may all claim for personal injury claims. Um, and again, that is something that is used to be more common than it is today. Um, most of the insurers, in fact, all of the insurers now would have uh, quite stringent fraud, fraud prevention strategies. Um, it's funny because uh, Blake and I were driving home towards Drogheda one day quite recently and the car in front of us kept jumping on the brakes. So much so to the point that I actually pulled off the road and yeah. waited because that car that was in front of us, he kept deliberately jumping on his brakes and it, it appeared that they were they were attempting to be hit by this expensive car that I happened to be driving. So, yeah. it, so it still is an issue, I think. It, it can happen. Now, that may have not been the case. You may have not have been driving behind a fraudster. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe not. It could have been something <laughs> else. Um, but that does happen, certainly. Um, but the insurance companies now are quite attuned to that. Um, and any instance where they suspect a fraudulent claim, uh, they would investigate that um, and in many instances, um, the investigation goes in favour of the insurance company, because ultimately what what happens is that if there is and there are lots of fraudulent claims um, across the full market, everybody's price increases. And this is not a, a victimless crime. And as some people think, well, actually, it's a, it's a big company. It doesn't matter. They can afford it. Yeah. Um, if that happens consistently and in large volumes, everybody's Every, everybody pays the price. Everybody's insurance goes up a certain degree because um, insurers as companies need to make uh, a margin. And even on that, it's it's again, it's it's a it used to be a, a widespread thought that insurance companies make an awful lot of money. Mm -hmm. They do not. Um, they are trying to cut premiums where they can in order to be competitive. Um, and any fraudulent cases, any fraudulent claims make it harder for them to uh, make that small margin. Um, and as a result, then uh, premiums 
in that kind of market would increase. A, a comment slash question here. Why are our policies so difficult to read and understand? Can we simplify the language now? I think that's something that we've done quite a bit of yeah. work on in the last 12 yeah. to 18 months. I think th uh, there's a couple of things here, Patty. So uh, the first thing is that insurance, while people, most customers may think that it's a straightforward thing, it is really complicated and behind the scenes because of the levels of cover, the differences in the scheme that you have, the differences in the policy that you have, um, and the different regulatory constraints that are on insurance, um, it's quite legalistic in terms of the terms and conditions. And what we've tried to do at the AA is to um, write it in what we call plain English in order to try and make it more understandable user um, and user-friendly for customers. Um, but that said, it is a complicated, regulated product and that level of complexity exists right across the board but where we do have communications with customers whether that's by email or by direct mail or, or policy wording or even on the phone um, we try and explain things in a way that customers will understand okay. as best as we can but unfortunately in some cases because we have to be very explicit about certain legal implications um, of the insurance policy, it does have that legalistic tone. Okay, perfect. Um, some more questions here. Can I insure two cars in my name in Ireland? You can, you can. And uh, I know that you, Paddy, you're a big fan of um, yeah, yeah. cars. Yeah, I know. A bit of a it's a, head. Well, it's a bit of a sickness, I think, yeah. more than anything else. Um, yeah, so you can have more than one car in your news, name. Great news, great news. Are, are older cars more expensive to insure? And if so, why? They can be. Now, at the older age of cars, there's a bit of a, a split and a, a very discreet limit in age. <clears throat> so for classic cars, uh, interestingly, um, the price of the insurance is quite low. But and you again, also already have to have a policy in place. <clears throat> yes, you do. Um, and the reason for that is that in the main, and not always, but in the main, uh, drivers of classic cars tend to be car enthusiasts. They tend to have the classic car not as their primary vehicle, yeah. so they're driving it not as much, um, and it tends to be in fair weather, um, and not very fast, and not very fast because they've no choice. Yeah, <laughs> they don't go very <laughs> fast at all. Correct. <clears throat> but but so I think there's that middle ground, I suppose, where some cars are maybe ten, twelve years old that they can yeah. end up being a bit more expensive. Is just because of X or potential for for wear and tear. Risk. It's lots of those things. So that kind of risk profile comes into play again um, because of, you know, cars that are older may tend to break down more. If someone's driving their car and it breaks down, the the frequency of a claim is higher. Um, also, the age profile in general of customers that would uh, have that age of car um, is interpreted by the insurance company as a slightly higher risk and again that higher risk increases the premium and not not so directly related to that but have you seen any trends in relation to electric vehicles are the, are the premiums tend to be reasonable for EVs because of the nature of how they're driven and the, and the owners etc um so far yes Paddy um now obviously the whole EV um market and the EV situation is evolving almost on a daily basis um I think all of the manufacturers in Ireland at the moment are releasing EV vehicles and they're probably outselling all other types of cars. Um, in terms of the average premiums, um, again, part of it ties down to the, the price of the car. So um, unfortunately, at the moment, you don't get much change out of 30, 40 grand no. for an EV vehicle, you know, um, and when something goes wrong in them, now that doesn't happen very often, but if something goes wrong, it's quite costly to get it fixed. and. Uh, some of the EV vehicles, um, because there's so many sensors around them, even that small instance of reversing into a lamppost, um, it may yeah, end up causing yeah, thousands of, of euros exactly, of damage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, slightly connected to a question I asked you a couple of seconds ago, can two cars be insured but on the same policy? So yeah. if you ha can you have one policy but with several cars on that one policy? Um, at the moment in Ireland with the AA, no. Uh, that can't happen. Now, in the UK, um, some of the larger insurers, Admiral, for example, um, they offer what they call a multi-car policy. And you can have, if you have your car and your partner's car on that same policy. So you pay one premium, it covers both vehicles. It takes out the, 
I guess that um, you get that peace of mind, I guess, of having um, uh, both cars on that single vehicle. Um, sorry, on that single scheme. Doesn't sound like a bad idea, that. It doesn't sound like a bad idea. Um, can I drive another car on my insurance? And that's, a, a, I think, a very relevant one for us in, in AA. So, so can you? You can. Um, so if you're fully comprehensive, again, and you have the driving other cars option, um, you can drive other vehicles. Um, but is that instead of your own, do you have to transfer it over? Or is it just like if you, your granny said, can you move my car down yeah. to the shop? Or so whatever? you can't you can't drive the other vehicle and then have it as your primary vehicle. Yeah. Um, but effectively what it means is that if you needed to drive your granny's car down to the shop, um, there's no issue that you're covered that you're legally covered yeah. you're legally covered and if you have an incident um, you're covered um, by the insurance company and your policy so overall global picture for 2023 uh, is the market going to change much is there, are we going to see any uh, new trends or is it going to be sort of business as usual I think it's going to be really interesting what happens with the EV market um, as it kind of rolls out and gathers momentum um, I think in Ireland in particular because of you know the the urbanization of where people are driving um it's going to be very interesting as to how that flows through to insurance premiums uh and how quickly people get to grips with driving an electric vehicle rather than a, a petrol or a diesel vehicle um in terms of other trends um we've all heard and seen the the programs about the autonomous vehicle and at some point we won't even need um, to be thinking about driving at all, it'll all happen automatically by robots or inbuilt yeah, onboard sensors. computers. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's some way off. It is yet, a little bit yeah. in Ireland, and in particular because of the road network um, mm. outside of the urban areas. Um, you know, uh, putting your your own life or your family's life in the hands of a robot on some of the country roads around the country. Um, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, it can be challenging. Yeah, I'm not sure I would go but there. But it's funny how much we trust. The technology already certainly i do in the car some of the cars we drive yeah um it's amazing how you just sort of oh yeah that'll do that that's you know you're on a motorway at 120 with the radar cruise control on and you yeah. think yeah that's fine i think a motorway is fine because um and again even just the um the the 4g 5g or 3g connection that the that the vehicle needs um but in some of the more urban or rural areas you may not have that um so i think but that's that will change and um, that is where the motor industry is going um, and I was thinking about uh, places like some parts of Asia and North America um, they are testing fully autonomous vehicles um, I think it'll be a little while yet a little yet. while yes a little while yet well Dan as ever thank you so much and it's great to have you on the for the AA podcast finally thanks we'll buddy. get you on again and as ever if you have any questions for us on any subject do send them in to us and we'll bring on the experts and they'll answer it for you Okay, so I hope you're uh, more enlightened on car insurance now, Blake. It really is a fountain of knowledge, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this, he, he lives and breathes car insurance. Yeah, it, no, it was great to get his perspective as well, because car insurance is something that every one of us, and if you go down to any pub now on a Wednesday or Thursday night and you sit around the bar, you're going to hear people complaining about car insurance. That's one of those things. So it's great to get uh, that, that insight from someone who's behind the curtain, who knows what's going on and knows exactly how it works. And you'll see lots of new insurance products coming our way in 2023. Can't tell you about them right now. It's a secret, but watch this space. We'll be offering lots more in terms of uh, transport insurance products. There's a bit of a clue. And speaking of offers, do we have anything for our dear listeners this week? Ah, uh, yes, we do. It's time to don your swimming trunks, get the skis out or whatever image you don't want to think of there and think about travel because we have a special offer just for you. Please don't tell anyone else. Just use it for yourself. It is a special offer on the AA website. Now, this is a special website. Pay attention. It's not the AA.ie. It's AA.ie forward slash podcast travel offer. And if you go over there, you will see a very, very incredible price just for you podcast listeners. So we hope you enjoyed that podcast today. We're coming towards the end now. Of course, let us know what you think on the socials. We are up on LinkedIn, on TikTok, Instagram. We're up there everywhere. Please do let us know. Give us some feedback. It's great to get people's opinion and perspective on what we talk about. We really do welcome that. So we do hope that you enjoyed today and we will see you on next week's edition.